Namaste, and welcome back to Advaita Made Easy, episode number three. Today, I want to talk about a really important subject for understanding the nature of the mind and an area that especially is very sticky for us. It keeps us stuck in uh, ego identification. And that is the, the topic of vasanas or vasanas, depending on how you like to pronounce your Sanskrit. Uh, you may not be familiar with this term vasanas, but it is a Sanskrit term that means mental tendencies. So the, the easiest way to understand what vasanas are, we could say is sort of just karma playing itself out in the mind. So mental habits, mental addictions, um, habitual reactions to certain things. It, it, literally a vasana could be anything, you know, judgments towards others, judgments towards ourselves, insecurities, cravings, any repeat pattern at all appearing in the mind is a vasana. And so this is essentially our karma playing itself out in the mind, trying to find expression through the body, through the way we speak, the way we behave, the way that we react to life. So vasanas are like the strings that keep us bound to body consciousness. When our spirit wants to soar into its true nature of universal consciousness, vasanas keep us like Pinocchio, you know, on the puppet strings. The ego can just play us and pull that string whenever it wants. So I've heard a really interesting uh, analogy for vasanas from David Godman, who, who likens them to the YouTube sidebar of the recommended videos. You know, the YouTube algorithm pays very careful attention to what you watch and what subjects you're interested in. And it's always serving you a sidebar of recommended videos that it knows you'll be interested in to click on and stay on YouTube, right? It doesn't want you to go to another site or another social media site. So it's trying to keep your attention always. Well, it's no mistake that these social media algorithms are built exactly like the ego's built because these programmers, these you know, social media engineers understand how the mind works and how to keep people's attention so that they get more of the marketing and ad revenue and all the, all the attention goes to their site, right? They're really just replicating the human ego, which is a, a program in our mind that does the same thing. It, it pays careful attention to every thought we, we give significance to, every thought we believe in and are interested in. Ego saves all that data and is constantly serving us recommendations of what to think about, how to respond, how to react, what to feel, and so forth, because it just wants to keep our attention absorbed in the ego, because our attention is the oxygen that the ego breathes, right? So that's a really amazing and pretty much perfect analogy for what vasanas are. Uh, but there's another really great one that uh, Anamale Swami gave, who's a devotee of Ramana Maharshi. Anamale Swami said that vasanas are like domesticated chickens. <laughs> and now this is something that we don't really understand very well in the West, unless you're a farmer. But chickens that are domesticated to live on cement will run into lots of problems because something that chickens do apparently is that they scratch with their talons on the dirt pretty much constantly to kind of dig up bugs or, you know, scraps of food or something. And then they just peck. So they scratch and they peck. Well, when you move chickens to the cement, the concrete, they don't have the awareness to understand that there's no dirt to, to, to scoop. There's no bugs underneath the concrete. So they just keep doing what they're conditioned to do and they will eventually scratch their talons into like bloody stumps and they'll peck their beaks flat because they just don't know any better, right? And so we look at that and go, oh, stupid chickens. <laughs> and yet, aren't we all like that? Doesn't our ego turn us into like a domesticated chicken, scratching and pecking at the cement, just doing the same thing over and over again that causes us pain and suffering, and yet we're unaware of the source of our suffering, that we're really doing it to ourselves through our own ignorance because we're just running on this inertia, this conditioning, this habit of giving into these thoughts. So 
Vasanas are thoughts that are full of identity. So when they arise, they have a frequency to them that says, I must be carried out. You must speak me. You must do what I want you to do because it's, it's my thought. It's my urge. It's my desire. It's, it's personalized, right? But in reality, it's nothing more than your own energy, your own past energy being used against you, trying to duplicate itself in your mind. So if you want to know how many vasanas you have, the simplest thing to do is to sit down in meditation and just be quiet and watch your mind and see how active and noisy your mind gets. This is the difficulty that we have when we begin to meditate is that the mind is just so noisy that we can't seem to quiet it down and enjoy stillness. And that's because the mind has all this inertia, all these vasanas that are trying to get your attention. And when you just sit down to do nothing, they especially start to freak out, right? Because they're like, hey, we don't have time to sit here, man, and be quiet and do nothing. <laughs> We have to go fulfill all these unmet desires. So get up, go do what I want you to do. Go complete this task or whatever. And we feel this urgency within us, this anxiety welling up. Vasanas dig these deep roots in our mind in this way because we give in to them over and over and feed them. So they can only be defeated by holding on to the root of who is the I who wants this. Who is the self that wants to carry out this action? Whose desire is this? Is it the unlimited self of the universe? Or is it the limited conditioned self? You know, get into the habit of asking this question all the time. This is how you wake up from the dream, right? Just keep looking for yourself. Am I this dream character who's bound to this dream and all these dream desires? Or am I the dreamer? If something in me says, you are the dreamer, then I can't be truly bound or interested in anything happening in the dream because I'm just the witness. I may have had my attention engrossed and absorbed in the dream, but that doesn't mean I am the dream character. I'm still witnessing the character. So no matter how noisy your mind is, no matter how chaotic it is and how many vasanas there are, you are still aware of them. And that has to be where you begin to find yourself. It doesn't matter how many, you know, storm clouds are in the sky. The sky is always what it is. Vast, infinite, boundless. It doesn't get damaged by a storm cloud. It could be an F5 tornado, right? The sky is unaffected by it. So likewise, my true nature is boundless and free. I'm not truly affected by these thoughts. And so I want to give you a really powerful mantra that has served me greatly for many years to help me rest and abide in my true nature, especially when the mind is tempting me with a vasana. And the mantra is, I am perfect. I want nothing. This mantra calibrates in the 900s on the David Hawkins scale, because this is a statement that only the true self can make. The ego does not think that it's perfect. <laughs> Goes without saying, right? The ego sees all kinds of flaws and imperfections that it constantly wants you to improve. So it definitely doesn't think it's perfect and it definitely doesn't want nothing. <laughs> Ego has all kinds of unmet desires that it wants you to fulfill for it. So this statement, I am perfect, I want nothing, just flies right in the ego's face. It's a total reversal of the ego's sense of self. And if you repeat it in your mind, when you're tempted by vasanas, it will quickly pull the oxygen right out of them. At least in my experience. When you repeat this mantra with conviction, you are awakening the real self, which is totally uninterested and unbound by all your mental habits and tendencies. They're just illusions to the real self. It sees no reality in them at all. They're like a ghost of a ghost to your real nature. So we could also say that vasanas are the energies of the lower chakras, right? Our primal nature before they've been unblocked and balanced. 
And so when we carry out the actions the lower chakras want us to, it strengthens those blockages. So this is what keeps us from ascending to our divine nature in the higher chakras. The energy of the lower chakras has to be sublimated into the higher centers. So the question is, how do we do this? So let's look at the metaphysics of vasanas for a second. We know that consciousness and energy are one. Yeah. Consciousness is the cause of everything. Energy is its effect. So energy just mirrors consciousness because they're not two. So in order for consciousness to overcome an illusion, it requires tremendous energy because consciousness created the illusion to begin with by giving it attention and belief. So it then has to overcome its own creation and transcend to a higher point of view, which requires higher amounts of energy. So consciousness only expresses itself through our seven energy centers. Consciousness goes wherever the energy is directed, right? So when our lower chakras are full of energetic blockages, it's almost as if consciousness is trapped in the lower centers because there's so much energy absorbing its attention. So, you know, ego, body identification, fear, separation, and so forth. When we act upon these kinds of thoughts, our mental energy is absorbed into the lower chakras, which creates blockages. But when we don't act upon a thought, when we have awareness of a vasana, consciousness keeps that energy to itself, and then it can continue to expand upwards through the energy centers. You know, the nature of energy is upward spiraling. The law of one talks about this, that all energy is moving back towards the creator naturally. We call this intelligence, right? All energy is intelligent. That means when left to itself, it moves towards harmony, evolution, progression, wholeness, and so forth. So in most people, you know, on this planet right now, the lower energy centers are absorbing 90 to 99% of their energy which leaves very little of it for spiritual ascension, right? But the more energy that we release from the lower centers, the more of that can be used for spiritual ascension. But in order to sublimate this energy from the lower chakras, we have to stop feeding them with our attention of consciousness. So we have to learn how to keep our energy to ourself. And as we know, where you place your attention is where you place your energy. So the act of keeping your energy to yourself is what we call silence, a quiet mind. And this doesn't mean that there's no thoughts present necessarily. It means we're not giving attention to thoughts. That's a quiet mind. The more attention we give to the mind, the more energy it steals away from us and the less that we have available to overcome illusions with. So this is why a quiet mind is an absolute necessity for spiritual transcendence. You know, a noisy mind is like a boat full of holes or something. It's just losing energy rapidly and being swallowed up by the ego. It's a sinking ship. But when the mind is still, illusions disappear all by themselves because consciousness is endowed with all the energy, all the potential energy within us that it needs to transcend these false viewpoints of the ego. So when a vasana arises in the mind, it has so much spiritual gravity to it from all the previous times that we've carried it out, that it tends to soak up all the energy of consciousness. So it feels like the easy way out is just to give in to the urge to say or do or think about whatever it is. But that only increases the bondage, right? It only strengthens the blockages. So the addiction gets strengthened, the habit, whatever it is, gets energized. So when you learn to stand your ground and just sit with an urge without giving into it immediately, and especially to know who you really are in the midst of it, you take energy out of that vasana so it's this awareness of I'm not this urge, 
I'm not this desire. I am the awareness of it. I am the consciousness in which this is appearing, right? I'm the sky. This is just a cloud passing by. I don't have to give it meaning. It doesn't have to mean anything to me anymore. You know, this is a powerful weed whacker against the, the weeds of the mind, the vasanas. So in this way, through this practice of constant self-awareness, you must unearth your real nature from all the dirt and the rubble of the false nature that you've buried it under. The false nature is all of your mental habits and addictions and cravings. These are the things that obscure our real nature from us. But at the core of what you are is pure bliss. There is a place in you that wants absolutely nothing because it knows that it's already perfect and complete. It shines as peace and love and happiness. But to access it, you must be aware of it. And that's the key. If you are aware that you are not this limited conditioned self, but that your real nature is beyond all of this, then that real nature will inevitably emerge. It is impossible for the true self to stay buried underneath all of the conditioning of the mind. Once you're aware of it and you know it exists, it's like Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a little bit of yeast that someone puts into a, a lump of dough. And as they mix the dough, that little bit of yeast works its way through the entire dough. That's what your real nature is like. You just need the faintest glimmer of it to begin awakening it. And the magnitude of that real nature cannot be held back by the mind. So the constant awareness of who we are is really all we need to overcome the mind. But especially in the moments where the mind is tempting you to go back into conditioning, to repeat the same patterns, to think the same thoughts, to tell the same stories, that's where the mind wants to keep you trapped. So I want to summarize all of this into three basic points or methods to approach vasanas with. So we talked about number one, find the root. When a vasana appears, find the root of that vasana, meaning ask the question, the self inquiry, whose desire is this? It's the most important thing you can do. Whose thought is this? To whom does this urge belong? Is it the conditioned self or the unconditioned self? You give your true nature a chance to respond when you ask that question. Number two is to carry out the opposite action. And this is a really important one as well, that if you can commit to doing this, it's a very powerful way of destroying vasanas in your mind. If there's a certain urge arising to do something or say something, the best thing you can do in that moment after being aware of it is then to carry out the opposite action. So if your mind wants you to judge someone, uh, you know, you notice your mind getting judgmental towards someone, you immediately stop and go, ah, I love that person. I see nothing to judge in that person. This is really the essence of karma yoga of doing good deeds. It's more than just trying to make up for, you know, past sins or something. It's actually, an understanding of the root of consciousness and energy being one that consciousness and energy follow and mirror one another. So if we make our energy do something that's in alignment with higher consciousness, it sublimates that energy from the lower centers up to the higher centers. Only the higher centers want to be of service to others, want to be loving, compassionate, kind. Uh, the lower centers want to be selfish and retract, right? And uh, think only of themselves. So by feeding the poor or helping people or being kind to others, we are forcing that energy from the lower centers to rise to the higher centers, right? We're giving more spiritual gravity to the higher centers, but the ultimate means of carrying out the opposite of what the mind wants is always silence and forgiveness. Those are always in direct opposition to what the mind wants. So keeping quiet, just observing and not reacting is the most important way to do this. But secondly, the act of forgiveness of forgiving the mind for having these thoughts, right? That's, that's as opposite as it gets from ego. 
So those things also pull energy from the lower centers and move that energy higher. The third point is to rest and abide in your true nature until that urge subsides. And this is the mantra that I gave earlier. I am perfect. I want nothing. You know, sometimes the, the storm the mind creates can be very overwhelming and we feel like we're just getting swept away by it. So you can sort of grab on to the telephone pole of this mantra and just hold on to it while the storm rages around you. Uh, this, this mantra for me has been like an anchor point in truth that just observing what the mind is doing, leaving it, you know, without any resistance towards it and just repeating what's true. I am perfect. I want nothing. Again, that's a powerful way of sucking the oxygen out of these vasanas because all they, all they want is for you to give in to them. And every time a vasana appears in your mind, it's using some energy to do so. And the mind only has a certain store of energy, right? A certain amount available. And every time it throws a, a thought up, especially the more intense it is, the more craving and urge is there, means the more energy is there. So if you don't give in to that urge through whatever means necessary, then the ego just wasted a bunch of energy and it will eventually have to retreat, right? It will notice how much energy it's losing and say, all right, let's cut our losses. We'll come back next time with uh, a different version of this thought that might work. So those are the three most important, um, I don't want to use the word strategies, but you know, methods of approaching vasanas to begin dissolving them in your mind. But I want to give you one more uh, bonus point, maybe. And this is that if you do act on a vasana, if, if you didn't have the awareness necessary to observe a vasana and ignore it, but you got pulled into it and you, you carried out the action or the thought or whatever, you can still pull energy out of that vasana by doing one important thing. And that is to recognize as soon as you do become aware that you gave into a vasana, recognize as soon as you can, how totally futile that it was. If you can recognize that giving into that urge, that thought, that craving, whatever, did not provide you with anything you're looking for. And it just perpetuated your problem. If you can have that recognition, you can still drain energy out of that vasana. So this is a journey that, you know, goes on for many years. Don't have any expectations of getting rid of all your vasanas, you know, and a couple of weeks or something, <laughs> if only, if only, right? But no, we are here. Our souls come here to do this, to disentangle ourselves from all the karmas that we've loaded ourselves up with because our true self is unconditioned. It is as spontaneous and unpredictable as the present moment is. It responds just to the flow of life itself. It doesn't respond to patterns of conditioning. You know, it's always new and fresh. And so the sage is like that. You know, the enlightened mind is always new and fresh, just like the present moment. Even the sage doesn't know what her next action will be. You know, she's just the witness. So when we get beyond the realm of the predictable, the habitual conditioned mind, there is only mysterious, spontaneous, effortless freedom. And this is why Christ said, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must become again like a little child. Because children, for the most part, are unconditioned, right? They don't know what anything means yet. And they don't have a concept of resisting something they feel. They're just always in a state of openness and observant curiosity towards life. And so we must aim on the spiritual path for that childlike mind. Because when, when you think you know everything, man, the mind has you firmly in its grip. You know, you'll grab hold of every thought the mind throws your way when you think you know everything. Certainty is like the ego's playground. It's where the ego thrives. But certainty is ignorance. Certainty really is not knowing, right? Mystery is the openness of show me who you are reality. 
reveal yourself to me because I can't possibly conceive of how great you are. That's the attitude for self-realization. Because when you know that you don't know anything, can you really say that that's ignorance? Not really, right? That's actually the highest form of wisdom to know that you don't know. And then reality just shines forth like the sun, radiant, blindingly brilliant and undeniable. So the mind is the voice of certainty, but the true self is silent mystery. The mind is conditioned bondage. The true self is spontaneous freedom. Hey everyone, thank you for watching today's video. I hope that you were truly blessed by it. And I wanted to let you know that I'm really excited to now be partnering with an amazing conscious supplement company called Organifi. A lot of you know that I'm also passionate about holistic health and nutrition. And Organifi has been a staple in my daily health routine for a very long time. They make the most delicious, organic, and high quality superfood products that I've ever come across. And as you know, a healthy body is a great benefit for spiritual growth because the health of your body directly translates to the health of your mind. Everything is connected. So feeding your body with high vibrational superfoods straight from the earth is one of the best ways to create that environment for a healthy mind. But getting all the superfoods that your body needs in one day can admittedly be a little bit tough. And that is where Organifi can add a ton of value to your life. I personally start every day off with green, which is Organifi's really delicious blend of 11 superfoods like ashwagandha, chlorella, and moringa. And then in the middle of the day, I'll usually have a scoop of red, which is a delicious energy blend full of 13 adaptogens and antioxidants from berries to recharge your mind and body with a delicious blend of organic superfoods. Your body is an amazing organic machine but it needs the right fuel and signals to function at its best. And red is full of adaptogens sourced from organic herbs and medicinal mushrooms. And these are compounds that balance hormones, prime your energy pathways and alleviate stress. So instead of crushing your adrenal system with huge doses of caffeine every day, adaptogens work with your body and give you natural sustained energy all throughout the day. What's most important to me though about Organifi is the way that they go above and beyond to ensure the cleanest and purest ingredients in all of their products. They are USDA certified organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, certified glyphosate free, and absolutely zero fillers. So I never go anywhere without Organifi and I never miss a day without taking it. And Organifi is offering a super generous discount of 20% off of your entire order when you use the coupon code ABKEY at checkout. So if you wanna upgrade your health regimen with Organifi, you can click on the link in the description box below to learn more about all the amazing products that they offer. And I promise you that your mind and your body are gonna thank you for it.